Welcome to Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And I've been looking forward to this show for about six months, maybe longer, because <laughs> Mr. Briscoe and I did a show on Don Eagle and Gorgeous George and the screw job finish. And when I ran into this gentleman in Vegas at the Cauliflower Alley Club, I asked him about it because he's a wrestling historian. He told me so much information that I had no idea about that I called Mr. Briscoe as soon as I left him and told him we've got to have Steve Johnson on our show. It was just absolutely amazing. Steve's a wonderful historian, a bunch of books that have been written about wrestling, a fantastic style of writing. The good part is he doesn't write about these prima, prima donna baby faces. He writes about heels <laughs> and storytellers. <laughs> But he's got a great one coming out about one of the greatest baby faces of all time, Mr. Jim Londos, which I'm incredibly honored to be able to write the forward for. I just started reading it. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Mr. Steve Johnson, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, guys. It's so good to be with you. And thanks for thinking me of this. Well, it, you know, well, it's, it's just, it's, it's, go ahead, Jerry. I would say, well, yeah, I want to personally thank you, too. When John called me from Vegas, I mean, right, he, he literally, when you got finished your conversation, he called me that we got to have Steve on. I said, man, let's get him on. And, uh, and, you know, it took us a little while to, to track everything down and get get the timing right for all three of us to get to you on. But, man, what a pleasure it is. I've been reading a lot of your stuff for, for it seems like a long, long time. I know you're not that old, but your your stuff is, is out there. And, and any wrestling fan, man, it's just history. You know, it, 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 if, you, if you're interested in our, in our business, and it is a business, and our sport, you, you have to check out some of Steve Johnson's work here. So thank you again. Well, thank you for your support because uh, we've used you in just about every book that we've done. We've we've, <laughs> we've relied on the Briscoe connection. So, <laughs> Did you I cover appreciate that Mr. very much. When Mr. Briscoe was on the, on the undercard when uh, the Archangel wrestled the devil. For... <laughs> 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 Mr. Briscoe gets called for all these uh, different top things. That's the reason I'm so happy that he's with me. For one, for one, he's my <laughs> friend. But two, he, he's the one that's been there for all these events and throughout the years. He knows everybody. Yeah, it is. You know, when you've been around like me, I mean, you run across guys. And, you know, we're, before we came on, we're talking about Jim Londis. We'll, we'll get to him a little bit. But, you know, even back in the dressing room when, when I was a rookie, they were they were talking about Jim Londis, you know. And uh, this was like in night, late 1960s. So, you know, I, I kind of grew up in locker rooms listening to stories about Jim and, 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 you know, the double crosses and stuff like that. But man, you got a real unique way of, of, of putting it. And I never looked at this one, double crosses and screw jobs. I mean, they're, you know, they're different things and they're meant for different reasons and everything. We'll get into all that. So my partner there, the smart one, John, John's got a whole, a whole, uh, uh, library, a document there on how to, how to do this. So I'm going to kind of, just lay back and join in here and let John take it over. John Grow, man. Steve, you, you sent us a bunch of notes, which were greatly appreciated because, uh, especially since they had small words in them, because me and Mr. Briscoe are from the South. <laughs> we, we don't do well with big words. But you you had a uh, first part of it, the preamble to it, talking about screw jobs uh, and double crosses, about why they are, have happened, about the prevalence of them, and also the fallout to that. Yeah. You got to explain a little bit what you had in your notes and what you meant by that. Sure, guys. You know, there was a, a screw job that happened in the late 90s that everybody probably remembers. And the rationale behind that screw job was that somebody didn't acknowledge the quote unquote time honored tradition of losing a championship belt on the way out of the company or the way out of the territory. And those words always stuck with me time honored tradition. Because if you look, in wrestling history in any way, shape, or form, there is a time-honored tradition, but that's not it. The time-honored tradition is promoters screwing wrestlers. That's, <laughs> that's the time-honored tradition since the start of the business. I love, I love that quote when I saw I cracked up just like John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is, but as long as anything has been at stake, a world championship, a regional championship, just championship of each other, Promoters, managers, and wrestlers have engaged in screw jobs, double crosses, trying to pull a fast one on the other guy. Uh, it may not happen now as much as it did in the past, but it really is a time-honored tradition in wrestling. We always say uh, among our little group that looks at these things that wrestling has a past, but it doesn't have a history. Well, we're trying to piece together that history 
because if we understand that a little better where we came from, we might have a little better idea of where we're headed. Hey, Steve, you, I read something on the internet. I didn't, I didn't want to surprise you with this because it may, may or may not be true. You know, Abraham Lincoln wrote a bunch of stuff on the internet. All that's true, of course. You know, if you read <laughs> anything on the internet, it's it's obviously very true. Wait a minute. Abe Lincoln invented the internet then? Was he what he the did, point? yes. Okay. Way before Al Gore did. <laughs> Abe Lincoln invented the internet. Us, most people don't know that. But it's I read true. something from him on Twitter today. So, yeah. You know, you know, that's the great thing about this show, too, man. We educate people so, so deep in this show. That's right. I read, uh, doing research for the show, which was a lot of fun to do, that the three count in wrestling developed or somewhere around the 20s to 30s because it helped prevent screw jobs. Is that there's any veracity to that? Or do you know about this? Yeah, there is a lot of veracity to that. Um, in part, it symbolized to the crowd that there was a legitimate count taking place. Okay. Because some of the early screw jobs were just the referee tapping a guy on the back and saying, quietly, you won. Okay? There was no obvious indication that anything had happened. Uh, in fact, the audible three count didn't come till a little bit later on. And of course, that's morphed into all kinds of screw jobs on its own. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's part of it. Um, the other part of it that I think is important is you have to remember that Although WWE and whatever the other promotion is kind of run the show now, in the 20s and 30s, even up into the 40s, there was no controlling alliance in wrestling. Okay, Managers, promoters, and wrestlers kind of controlled the world championship, their own bookings, and things like that. So you, you, if you were involved in a screw job or a funny finish or something like that, you didn't have to report to the home office the way you would today. You know, if if somebody had pulled a, a screw job that was pulled on uh, Zabisco and Munn in 1925, they'd be fired tomorrow and looking for work at Hardee's. Uh, back then, it was just an accepted part of the business because you really didn't report to anybody uh, except yourself. Right. So the governance of wrestling has kind of changed the way things have done done over the years. I like okay. the kind of the way you, you highlighted it too. You know, I mean. There was there was you know, you know, there was no control, so there were a lot of backyard type, you know, what we could we call I guess later on spot show type events there, and then in, in those spot show events, I guess there were numerous screw jobs that was never reported, and there was a screw job that and and uh, double crosses that that were never reported, and you know, go looking through your list, it just seems like it was the major major like Madison Square Garden and and the bigger events where these things were able to get the mainstream press. Is that the way you, you you found it when you researched? I was just finishing up a piece today on, on some of the edits for the Londis book where the title, the world title was estimated to be worth $200,000 oh, in 1930. Wow. That's 1930 dollars. I, wow. I don't have an inflation calculator here, but I'm sure that's several million right now. Um, so if you consider the title was worth that much, yeah, you might do something underhanded to get a piece of that action. Yeah. Sure. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Hey, Steve, I got a question for you that, that we'll, and we'll get to the topic of screw jobs in just a second. But I was watching last night a match between uh, Jim Londos and Primo Canera. And Canera is actually a really good heel, by the way. You know, he's a great big guy, kind of like Ernie Ladd with the tape thumb. You know, he had the, yeah. the headlock. Max Bear was the referee, and he had wow. the headlock. He did go around, he'd thumb him in the eye. You know, this former boxing world champion. I've heard reports. But hey, John, you just said a magic thing. Even he'd go around behind the referee and thumb him in the eye. You know, that's right. That, that's, that's right. right. That's a heel, and that's a loss art being a heel. <laughs> it, was so, it was so good. It was. A, it was actually a really entertaining match. Uh, ended up in a draw, of, of course. But Primo Canera, there was re reports that he may have never had a legitimate boxing match. How 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 fixed. We we know that you know wrestling at one point was a legit sport. Boxing at one point was a legit sport, and has morphed in and out since. They've had how how fixed was boxing during that time? Have you ever heard that about Primo Carnero? Yeah, there's a great book by Primo Carnero that fortunately was done by the same publisher that's doing our book on Jim Landis, and yeah, it was it was fixed, it was rigged. Um, he was controlled for a large part of his career by what we would politely call the underworld. <laughs> and he had actually more success, made more money as a wrestler 
than he did as a boxer, uh, which is fairly unusual, I would think. Yeah. So yeah, he was, Primo was one of those guys who engaged in two worked sports. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And there's so much amazing, you know, about uh, Vince McMahon's grandfather, you know, pr promoting the fight down in Cuba, you know, with uh, the, the, the Jack, Jack, uh, Jack, Jack Johnson. Johnson. You know, it's just it's such an interesting time. But let's get to a, a one of the screw jobs, one of the famous ones that I don't understand at all. And Mr. Briscoe was around with WWE then, I believe. I don't know if he went from uh, Carolinas to WWE at that point. But I don't know if you were there or not. Took the, took the train up there. That, that's right. <laughs> Wendy Richter versus Spider Lady, November 25th, 1985, Madison Square Garden. I don't understand any of this. Steve, either. could you enlighten us a little bit about this? I can't understand any of it either. You know, I, I developed a little typology of screw jobs that were promoter driven, wrestler driven, or business driven. This one just looks like uh, an attempt by. Uh, the former head of WWE to put somebody in her place. Wendy Richter was, Mr. Briscoe can verify, unbelievably popular, not just in wrestling, pop culture, yeah. right? She was in that cartoon that was on on Saturday mornings. And Mula, under the guise of Spider Lady, was sent into the ring to beat her. I think most people agree she didn't actually beat her, but they got a fast count out on her shoulder. What sense would it make to put the world championship on a 60-year-old woman at that point when you had a young, attractive, virile lady like Wendy Richter who was on the verge of becoming a cult hero, especially as you were trying to grow a female following? I'm not sure I can explain that. Uh, Mr. Briscoe, do you have any idea? No, and I, I was going to ask you, did, did, has Wendy ever made any comments? But, and I, you know, number one, you know, well, I didn't know. Mula. Come on, Mula had a body at at that time. You know, she's in her sixties. That was unmistakably the fabulous Mula. I mean, you're you're not going to recognize that body. And then, you know, and in the match, as far as I I, I can tell, it was was a work match. A regular one wasn't a you know like a shoot type match. I I still to this day don't understand and didn't understand the philosophy. That was before my time actually going to the WWE just right before it, or being in the office part of it. I think I was with it, but I was with the local promotion down here in Florida doing that. So yeah, I, I was as shocked as anybody else. And uh, Number one, come on, Wendy, you, you, you're a smart lady. You don't know that's moving there. Come on. Yeah, Jerry, especially in the garden. Yeah, in the I mean, garden. You're wrestling in Madison Square Garden, and you haven't even talked to your opponent beforehand. Yeah. I mean, this is not separate dress rooms because no. you know how the garden is made. You're yeah. way behind the curtain. You're you're able to get to your opponent very easily with easily. nobody seeing. Yeah. It just seems crazy to me. She wrestles yeah. the whole match as a work, and then all of a sudden, as it looks like a work, and then yeah, all it looks like a work to me. Yeah. And Mula pulls the the hood off, and all of a sudden, yeah. it's Mula and Wendy yeah. acts confused, like she's still fighting. Yeah. yeah. It, the whole thing made no sense to me. And I still Ooh. wonder today if it was really a screw job, Steve. I, mean, I that, do too. That, that, that was my thought, was it? I mean, come on. There, there's too much too much obvious going on there. Well, Wendy, Wendy said repeatedly afterwards that it was a dispute over money, a dispute that she wanted to be yeah. paid, if not main event money, at least not preliminary event money. Uh, and, you know, she got... Got put in her place. Uh, the irony, yeah, but, is, but like, 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 like you mentioned in your notes, like you mentioned in your notes, she got screwed, but she still was kept around. She still, you know, was kept around a little while, while, while longer, and then made made pretty damn good money, you know, back in that time for a woman, you know, and was put in the WWE Hall of Fame. Exactly. Um, which the, the interesting thing to me, though, and John mentioned it was Madison Square Garden, middle of the ring. That's as embarrassing as you can get. If you're going yeah. to screw somebody in Greenville, South Carolina, or Pocatello, yeah. Idaho, that's another thing, I think, another thing entirely. And if I was trying to pull the wool over somebody, that's probably where I'd do it. Yeah. But in Madison Square Garden, everybody's watching. The whole world is watching. Yeah, and it just seems crazy to me that that Wendy didn't know. And, and, and to Mr. Briscoe's point, they haven't had interviews that I've seen since that explained it from anybody. You know, Mula didn't explain her 
part of view. It doesn't seem like Wendy did, except for the fact what it was over. But the fact that she's wrestling in the ring against somebody that she's never seen before, the spider lady, come on. <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever. You're the garden, and all of a sudden you've got some person out here going for a title that you've never heard of. It, the whole thing makes – it's just crazy to me. Like you know, you wonder if it was a double cross. That's what I wonder. That's what I wonder if it's not some elaborate. Okay, we're going to fool everybody, yeah. and we're still talking about it to this day. Yeah. The, uh, us us marks are still talking yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> Trying you, to figure out what are, it is. You guys are starting to sound like Vince Russo here. Holy <laughs> cow! That's it. Show's over. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's so the great thing about the about double crosses and the screw jobs, though. You, you you don't know what's true and you don't know what's not unless somebody's sworn out an affidavit and which actually there are a couple of cases of that well let me ask you about a different one which uh, was not in the notes we talked about the, uh, we got on the air uh, but together before we started recording is uh bruno san martino and buddy rogers one of those famous matches of all times because that that helped create the wwwf which was in competition with the nwa which is you know from 1963 on which was you know has since become uh, i think most people would agree the, the preeminent belt uh preeminent title uh, Bruno San Martino, I interviewed him, which was one of the greatest thrills of my life. And he told me point blank, that was a shoot. They got Buddy Rogers there under the pretense that, uh, Bruno was, uh, he was going to, Bruno was going to put him over and he had had a heart attack or something recently, you know, a few months before they got him cleared by the New York athletic commission, which was not that hard to do. If you knew the right <laughs> athletic commission, that's right. And then they got him in the ring and Bruno said, grab your best hold. And Bruno, if you watch some of the pictures, because there's not any videos of the, the whole match, he didn't turn his back to walk back to the his corner like he always did because he he just told him this was a shoot. And he goes, I didn't want to get sucker punched. And he, he backed up in the corner. They went over and grabbed him. And, you know, Buddy Rogers was no match for Bruno and gave up in, the, in a short amount of time. Is that what your take is on this uh, as well, Steve? Well, I think the take is like the Richter – spider lady thing you're never quite sure bruno was very protective of kayfabe throughout his career but i will tell you that uh, dick steinborn who used to live here in richmond uh, i spent a lot of time with and bruno told dick steinborn you know off camera in private that yeah he was he went out there and took care of buddy in 48 seconds or whatever what it was and uh it was very much, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. Yeah. Now, Mr. Briscoe, I'm not sure if we can rely on Dick Steinborn as the best character witness. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and, and I agree. And I love Dickie to death. I mean, I was fortunate enough to know him when I was first getting into business down there in Florida. Dickie was a, a unique character in this business. And John, he would be a subject matter. And if we, as Steve knows him like that, I would love to discuss uh, Dickie Steinborn and his career because what a fascinating person he really was. But uh, yeah, you're right. But on on that same token, you know, you know, we were talking about the differences that what what repercussions uh, that these screw jobs and double crosses make here. This was the NWA was was a power organization. Vince Senior was was doing his thing in, in the Northeast there, just, just trying to get you know, his own organization. And they wanted their champ where, where they could control the champ. Is that really the the genesis on why this happened? Yeah, and it was apparently yeah. a, a bit of a power struggle between Tootsmont and Vince McMahon Sr. Oh. over Buddy Rogers or Bruno Sammartino. And Sammartino was drawing great money up in uh, Toronto when he went up there. And you know, they, so it was under pretense that – they brought Buddy in and paid him a ton of money and got him through the medical commission that he was going to be out there and he was going to be okay. But apparently that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't what Bruno San Martino had in mind, which obviously he had the blessing of the WWWF to, to do that. Uh, the, the question you'd have is if um, he's going to beat him, he beat him in 48 seconds with a bear hug or hug, whatever the time was. I think it was 48 seconds, uh, but it was quick. Um does that say to you that it's a shoot or would it be more impressive if they went eight, 10, 12 minutes? Not, not that Rogers had to do anything if he was under the weather. Um, so that's kind of a, that's a question that lingers in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. So, what was, was Bruno even doing those eight, nine, 10 minute matches? Uh, <laughs> that's right. 
you know, <laughs> at that time. I don't recall him going that long. You know, it was, it was usually Bruno's matches were usually pretty, pretty quick. But they usually started off with a series of arm drags. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in this, in this one, he and that's a real, that's right a in. real, that's a real working move too. That's right. Hard <laughs> shoot move, arm drags. Yeah. So, so what is you guys take on this? Shoot or not shoot? I say not shoot. I say I think I, I well, I, I, I shoot where, where he took the title, but I, a buddy, buddy, buddy was never known to be a tough guy, and in, in my recollection of buddy. And then for Buddy and Bruno was was a legit guy, a legit, a legit tough guy in my estimation. I don't know how the historians paint Bruno, but in my history, uh, I think he was a where Buddy was 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 a worker. And so I think it was. I really don't know myself, but I, I think I, I see the political side of it as, as we we know some of these things are done. Where where Vince Senior really wants that belt and. It, it's sort of like you know when Jack went over with Bubba and gave Bubba how much it enhanced his territory, how much more it made Bubba a, a bigger star in Japan than what he already was. So is this a is this then senior play to get to get to get Bruno in the, in that status or share status there? I don't know. Bruce? Let me suggest let me suggest an in between position. Bruno could have thought it was a shoot. Yeah. And Buddy and and Vince Senior could have thought it was a work that's those two things are possible at the same time aren't they well yeah I, they are. I put it like that but yeah you're exactly right yeah and, and, and the more you you bring that up i said man that that probably what happened because i don't think buddy would go in there and knowing buddy roger and i got to know buddy when he's booking out there I, I booked with him for like a year and um he was the Never a tough guy. Never talked to. Him. I don't think Buddy would put himself in a position where he knew he was going to have to go down there and shoot. I think I, I really don't. I don't. I don't believe he'd put us. Uh... And Buddy, just speaking about Buddy Rogers, he was a really hot heel at the time, right? Oh, he was just unbelievably hot. Everywhere too. During I mean, that I time, he was yeah. he was the hottest he was the hottest heel in the country since uh, the Gorgeous country. George, right? But he, the thing was, he was a little bit older at that time. He was in his 40s. He came to it a little bit late. Uh, he was also not the easiest guy to get along with. Buddy, look, Buddy uh -huh. looked out for Buddy. He had his own traveling company of folks right. that he would take to a territory and burn it. And I think Mr. Briscoe's smiling there and <laughs> burn the territory and then go somewhere else. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard him talking about it. You know, but I found that true in, in a lot of those old champions. I mean, Lou Lou took his guys around too. You know, and, yeah, that he could trust. So I don't think it was you know that out. I think Buddy might have been a, a, but George George and some of those guys they even had their little traveling troop, didn't they? I mean, you go back and a lot of those guys, you know, with the go uh, what the go dust trio or whatever they were up there, they had their little band of guys, you know, that they worked in in and out with. And then we're going to get to one of the screwdrivers a little bit later in Chicago. The, that group out there, you know, that 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 had the screwdriver. So I, I think with Buddy Buddy having his own troop of guys, I was smiling because I know when when he came down here, Eddie gave me uh, directions: do not let him bring his guys in. They're all past their prime. So I had to fight daily in the booking meetings with Buddy. You know, oh no, we can't we can't bring them in. They don't want them in. <laughs> Well, let's go to the one in Chicago then. Gorgeous George versus Don Eagle. Mr. Briscoe, you and I have done a whole show on this. Uh, it's a crazy finish. And when you watch the finish back, the way that Gorgeous George reacts is almost identical to the way Shawn Michaels reacted in Montreal. I mean, it's just, it was, and, and Gorgeous George, I, I don't know. Me and Mr. Briscoe couldn't figure out if Gorgeous George was in on it or not. I'm not sure that history, um, uh, it gives us a leaning either way, but Steve, I think you have a pretty good take on this. This was Gorgeous George versus Don Eagle, May 26, 1950 in Chicago. Steve. Yeah, this is something that even us historians still argue about to uh, to this day, but we do have the benefit of actually having documentation on this that we don't for Bruno or for Wendy Richter or some of the other ones. In the, in the 50s, the U.S. Justice Department investigated the National Wrestling Alliance as a cartel which was appropriate because it was a cartel. <laughs> they did an interview with Fred Kohler, who was the promoter in Chicago 
for the gorgeous George Don Eagle match and asked him specifically about it. And Kohler, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, spilled the beans. He had been having some problems with Don Eagle and his father. Don Eagle's father apparently was the Richard Williams of his day from Venus and Serene, just almost impossible to get along with. They had run out on a Kohler match, uh, which cost him, oh, I had it somewhere, uh, twenty or $30,000 uh, at the gate. And then at the time, there were two competing promotions in Chicago. Kohler and Leonard Schwartz was running opposition. Al Haft, who really had his claws into Don Eagle, was sending uh, Don Eagle to work for Leonard Schwartz. So Kohler had good reason to try and take him down a notch or two. He, he messed a show on him, and he was uh, involved in the opposition to him. So Kohler does say in the files of the Justice Department that he had told Gorgeous George to go out there and win any way he could. Now, a title didn't mean anything to Gorgeous George. It didn't mean anything to Kohler either. But revenge is a pretty strong factor. And when you tell somebody to go out there and do something, and probably he instructed the referee Earl Malahan, if George gets Don Eagle in any kind of compromising position, one, two, three, and get the hell out of there. Uh, I think that's probably, as long as it's actually in the files of the Justice Department, the best explanation for what happened at uh, the George Eagle match. Um, there are clips of it on YouTube, but several years ago, we found that those were edited versions. They were not the entire match. And more importantly, the voiceover had come after, mm. not contemporaneously with the match. So I'm not sure how much stock you can put into that. I can't account for George's, 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 George's reactions. He didn't need a belt, certainly. Uh, maybe he wanted to make it look good. Who knows? But I pretty much buy the philosophy that Fred Kohler was trying to teach Don Eagle a lesson, maybe like the way Mr. McMahon was trying to teach Wendy Richter a lesson. And you ended up with a double cross that didn't make any sense in the long run, but served the immediate purpose of bringing the guy or the gal down a notch or two. Well, it was gorgeous. Well, I, I, reaction was was not was muted. It wasn't like, "Hey, I just won." It was almost like, "Hey, what yeah, just happened?" Yeah, yeah. You know, which doesn't mean he wasn't in on. They they didn't present a belt or a, a title to, a championship to him or anything either, right? That's correct. And ostensibly, and if, I, if I'm correct on this, there wasn't it wasn't even a title belt. I think even the belt that uh, that uh, Eagle was using was was some other type of belt, tag team belt or something like that. Maybe it was some other belt, and then Gorgeous George lost whatever belt it was just a few days later to brace yourself, Luthez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is all one big inner circle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it ever? And it, it's that group of guys again, too, that we're talking about. You know, so. And Steve, but to, yeah, your point it, about it, Gordon, it, to your point it, about it, Gordon it, George, for oh, those that don't know, uh, George, George was a pretty good shooter, right? A pretty good tough guy. I mean, yeah, not, not like a world-class shooter, but George yeah. was a tough guy, right? Yeah, we did a piece on Gorgeous George in the, in the Heels book, which is actually a few years ago. Everybody I talked to who had any dealings with him when he was sober, said he, you didn't want to get in the ring with him if he, he got riled up. He he could handle himself. So it would have been nothing for him to take care of Don Eagle if he wanted to do so. Um, here, I found this here. So let me just read this back. This is These were Kohler's exact words. Um, they hurt me. So when I gave them Don Eagle back, he wasn't worth anything to them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I subscribe to the revenge theory. Oh. And it wouldn't it wouldn't it be just like a wrestling promoter to try and act out revenge on somebody in the short term without any idea of what it meant in the long run? Oh. <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah. of course. But they're just basically they're just wanting to take a shot at Don Eagle and Al Haft, right? I mean, that was the whole sum of what was going on here. It wasn't a, a matter of getting the title because they didn't use the title. They didn't. None of that seemed to, to to matter. It didn't matter. It didn't seem to matter at all to George. No, now, now I got, I got. Would would this also be? I mean, you know, uh, Don Eagle. He's a talent, and uh, 
I, I heard that y'all read that, that he was very hard to get along with. I even heard that back in the dressing room when I was a rookie and started and starting in it, he was hard to get along with. And you know, they wanted to teach him a lesson, but uh, you know, his his his, his uh, he he was he was a pretty good he was a pretty good shooter from what I understand too back in his day, right, Steve? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's uh, my my thinking about that, and there are some disagreements among historians, is that it was a fairly simple matter of Fred Kohler felt he had been aggrieved and he wanted to take it out on somebody. Gorgeous George happened to be there, and that's what happened. And yeah, let's this put this a... into perspective too. I mean, uh, that TV that they were on—that was at the time that was that was like WWE TV nationwide, correct? Or is that was it? Oh yeah, no, that, yeah, no, it's national TV. That's back when in the time when. Well, so you're making time. a point. You're making a point, not just locally. You're making a point nationwide. Yeah, like I said, he says when I, the time I give down, you go back to them. Them being halved, yeah, uh, he's not worth as much. Right. Mm -hmm. Steve, one of the things promoters would do at times uh, all during this was they, they would book guys different places without the guys knowing them, knowing about it, and then report them to the athletic commission and get them banned. So there was a lot yes. of ways to to make guys less valuable to other promoters, right? Oh, absolutely. In fact, that was part of the Justice Department's investigation of the NWA is that uh, NWA blackballed wrestlers through just that trick, double booking them somewhere where they didn't show all of a sudden, they're banned in California. They're banned in Texas. Uh, even Jim Landis, at one point, fell into the NWA clutches in terms of being briefly banned or told he's not going to be working for them. There was not, a, again, not a whole lot of long-term thought as to what was going on as long as they were keeping their cartel in order. Well, let's go to Jim Landis. Uh, Jim Landis against uh, Savoldi, uh, April uh, of 19... 33 londos one of the biggest stars in the world and savoldi londos is the one that double crossed savoldi right steve savoldi double crossed londos i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry yes yeah, savoldi double crossed londos yes. londos was a big time shooter right and londos was a legit uh tough guy they crossed double crossed him with the help of the referee they, 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 they're both they both could go a little bit shooting lines yeah, Londis had been champion since 1930, and Londis had an independent streak a mile long. Now, if you were working for pennies on the dollar for promoters during the Great Depression, you also probably would develop an independent streak a mile long. So here's another example of where, in this case, Jack Curley, the promoter in New York, and Tutsmont, his right-hand man, and a man who, I think Luthes said of Toots Moth one time, Mr. Briscoe, he'd steal the cream out of your coffee. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jerry, did you uh, ever know Toots Moth? Was he gone before you were in there? Toots was gone, but yeah, he was totally gone. It was just a memory. It was, it was one of those back, uh, back seat guys that you would listen to stories about when you were a rookie. Yeah, you know, and Toots, so. Toots was a heck of a... To, Toots was trained by who? By, uh, by Stanislaus or by Farmer Burns? Farmer Burns. Farmer Burns. Farmer Burns. So, right. Toots was... Toots was a legit guy, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was a sh shooter of the first order, absolutely. But he had suffered a, a leg injury or a knee injury in the late twenties and started working more as a right hand man to Jack Curley out of the New York office. Anyway, in this in this particular instance, Mont and Curley had tried to double cross Landis a couple times before. Landis had really good antenna for this kind of thing, was able to dodge those was not able to dodge the one in Chicago. He's fighting Joe Savoldi, jumping Joe Savoldi, the old Notre Dame yeah. football player. Yeah. Should have been easy pickings, you would think. The match was heavily advertised locally. In fact, John, you'll read this in the, in the book when you get to this part. If you bought a loaf of bread in Chicago the week of that match, you knew about Londis and Savoldi because they stuffed flyers into loaves of bread and distribute oh, wow. them all around the city. So that's wow. that was social media for the 1930s. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing in this that's one... A, that's an amazing story there. But the interesting thing in this one is there was a ref switch right before the main event of Londa and Savoldi. Emil Theory was the senior referee in Chicago, and somebody 
unidentified to this day, came up and said, look, why don't you take an earlier match? Londis and Savoli is going to be over quickly. You know Londis is going to throw the guy with a whole lot of, uh, with no effort whatsoever. Uh, it won't be a very fun match to referee. You take this earlier match and we'll bring in uh, Bobby Manigoff Sr. to referee the Londis and Savoldi match. So Theory said, okay. Well, the problem there was that Bobby Manigoff Sr. had been got, had gotten a little bit of extra money uh, above and beyond the $50 a night he was paid for refereeing matches. And when Savoldi got Londis in kind of a half compromising position near the ropes with one shoulder down, Manigoff taps Savoldi on the back, taps Londis on the back. Both men think that's a sign we go to the center of the ring and lock up again. Londis starts walking to the center of the ring. Manigoff raises Savoldi's hand. And this is the new heavyweight champion of the world. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, this is one of the immoral double crosses of all time because you're going against... <laughs> that's <the> horrible. <laughs> yeah. 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 Who was looking at that damn thing? John, going against, you're, going, you're going against one of the most popular wrestlers in the history of the sport for a guy, Saboldi, who was a good wrestler, but he was still only two or three years in the game. And uh, he now, he's the world champion. Londis protested. His manager protested. They filed protests with the Illinois State Athletic Commission. The Illinois State Athletic Commission, and these days commissions had teeth, Mr. Briscoe. The commission holds hearings. Tries to figure out what's going on. The commission brings in Joe Savoldi. He says, did you throw Londis? Savoldi goes, I, I don't know. <laughs> commission goes, can you throw Londis? Savoldi goes, ah, I don't know. <laughs> At this point, everybody kind of throws up their hands, except Tutsmont, who works a $100,000 contract with Savoldi to wrestle in Canada. <laughs> and take the belt there. Uh, wow. This is one of the all-time double crosses. The really cool thing was that even though people had a general sense that wrestling outcomes at that time were predetermined or at least worked, just about everybody in the industry and everybody in the press came to Londis's defense wow. on the grounds that if you're going to lose the championship, you really should lose one, two, three in the ring in not kind of in a half standing position where one shoulder's on the mat and no one knows what's going on. It's a it's a great story. It's it's even more detailed in the, in the book that John's going to write the forward to. But it is one of the all time classic double crosses. Yeah. Tell us uh, just a little bit about Jim Londos. I, I'm just fascinated with him. And when he told me about the book, I was so excited just to read it. Uh, because uh, Jim Londos, to me, I mean, you had this kind of a, a dark period of wrestling, you know, in my opinion, after Gotch and, and Hackenschmidt. Then you had the Goldust Trio come along, uh, Tootsmont, uh, Billy Sandow, and those guys that came along, and, and Stringer Lewis, and kind of brought professional wrestling to wrestling. And yeah. But you didn't really have a great champion during that time of the 20s. And all of a sudden, Jim Londos comes along, and it becomes this golden era again. I mean, he drew tons and tons of money. Tell us a little bit about Jim Londos, please. Well, let me ask you this way. When you were coming up through the ranks, and this goes for Mr. Briscoe, too, you were paying your dues. We all paid our dues. Did you pay your dues by riding across the Atlantic in steerage class, <laughs> re wrestling for 75 cents, no, but I made yeah, a trip from, from, from I made a trip from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Wichita Falls, Texas, on a damn slow train all the way through Texas for twenty five dollars. <laughs> okay, okay, that's not bad. Did you sleep in the rail cars like Jim Landis did? Yeah, I sure. I slept in wherever I could sleep in that old train too. <laughs> that's right. That's the great part about this is, folks today have access to WWE training centers and all kinds of wisdom and so forth. In that day and age, this was a hand-to-mouth survival every single day. And you had to just keep at it and keep at it. Uh, there were no territories where you could be booked six or seven nights a week. You're lucky to maybe wrestle once or twice a week for a few bucks. It was a tough way to come up. Londis was 
a remarkable guy. He was no more than the size of Dean Malenko, but he just had a way of connecting with the audience. It wasn't an outright histrionic Ricky Morton on being electrocuted kind of selling. It was very subtle, a grimace here, a moan there, connecting visibly with the people in the audience, moving from side to side, making sure you're in trouble, using a lot of rope-a-dope. And some of the matches at that time, of course, lasted an hour, two hours, and you just wear down his opponent over a period of time. It really revolutionized the way people, it really revolutionized the way wrestlers connected with people. No one connected with an audience, no one told a story better than he did. There's a match on YouTube where Landis wins the world championship from Br Bronco Nagurski, the football star, in right. uh, 1938. It's it's a great match. I just I, watched that I, match. I, 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 said, I said that to you, I think, John. That's uh, right. You, Jerry said it to me. I watched it. And, and you know, I, I don't mean to cut you off, Steve, but people talk about the greatest football player to ever wrestle. Uh, there's no doubt. It was Bronco Nagurski. Yeah. I mean, the guy was all pro. Sure. Oh, champion. absolutely. But if you watch that match, and remember at the time, Londis is 44, you think you're watching an Anderson Brothers match because he's grabbing the arm and he's working the arm. And he releases it, and they go into another sequence, and he grabs the arm, and he releases the arm. He takes the arm over the ropes. He takes it into an arm breaker. He throws the arm back behind Nagurski. He's actually telling a story. I can't possibly, at 5'8 and 200 pounds, compete with this greatest football player ever, head to head. But I can wear him down on one body part and eventually, in time, defeat him. That's, again, kind of the intuition Story I think telling. that he had in the ring. People naturally cheat for the smaller guy anyway. But when you realize what he's doing, you say, man, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Our, our old friend Frankie Kane used to watch tapes of Lundis and said, I just, I just never saw psychology like that, ring psychology like that before. Steve, I was watching, uh, I think last night, I think it was Primo Canero, but it could have been Nagurski because I watched both matches last night because I was all excited about it. And but what, and one of them, I think it's Primo, got him in the guard. So uh, you've got uh, you've got uh, Londos on top. He's in the guard. Londos turns it around into a Boston Crab, just grabs the leg, flips over, turns it into a Boston Crab. And I've never seen that done before. I'm looking at going, that's freaking awesome. I'm just seeing the I'm seeing the visual of it. There, wow! <laughs> it's incredible. He just grabs his legs as he's wrapped around him. Then he ends up stepping stepping over, and he's got him in the Boston Crab, and he's got him in a submission, and the freaking crowd goes nuts. Which I I was going nuts too, and I was in my living room. <laughs> that's, but that's Londo, what I was saying earlier. The popularity of Londos, uh, you know, he drew what a hundred thousand people back in Greece for a match, uh, according it's, to it's about ninety. We think it's closer to eighty-five or ninety thousand, but who's going to quibble at that point? Yeah, yeah. That that attendance record was not broken until Andre and and Hogan in WrestleMania, which is you know an entirely different order of magnitude. Um, to set. The records that he did and draw the crowds that he did over a 45 year career. Hey, Steve, we've got you frozen up here. Yeah. There you are. There you are. You're back. No, so, yeah, I'm, I can hear you guys. Okay. okay. You were frozen up just for a second. You're talking about over a 45 yeah. year career, the crowds he drew. Yeah, 40, 45-year career. Uh, am I frozen up again? You were for just a second, yeah. yeah. Okay, I was going to say, wrestled in 13 countries on four continents at a time when, you know, you went back and forth by steamship or a rail car and not by modern conveniences. It's a pretty amazing story, and, and we're looking forward to, to sharing it with people, hopefully in the coming months. And we'll go to a different uh, type of uh, screw job. Uh, and this is one that uh, apparently wasn't a screw job. Apparently it was a shoot. Don't know for sure. But Mildred Burke versus June Byers, August 10th, 1954. And there is more drama to this than a Hallmark movie. <laughs> this is 
This is an insane time with Billy Wolf divorcing one woman. Don't know what's going on with the other one, but it's a crazy time where apparently it was a shoot. Uh, Steve, what do you know about this? Well, this may be the only uh, the, the only match in history where the, the, the manager Billy Wolf was had been married to one contestant and was sleeping with the other. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in a dressing room with uh, all those characters at one time. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. Melda Burke, what, what, I just want a son, but I mean, she was what, what a, what a lady, what a performer she was. And how was the dynamic yeah, the, with Billy the, Wolf? Uh, it was casual. I mean, yeah, you know, there was after, after they'd done, done done their split, you know, and I, right. I, I can't I can't recall what year it was, and but yeah, Mildred Burke, she she was quite a fascinating lady. But that happened in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was reading your 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 writing that you sent to John on your notes, and and the match I guess was a horrible match on top of being a kind of a crazy finish, right? Uh, this was this was a, a Meltzer no star match. People it was a real, <laughs> real stinker roo, yeah. which proves the point about the about shoot matches to begin with is right. you know yeah. wrestlers wrestle not to lose, not to not to win, and yeah. you kind of get what you're asking for there. The double cross in this came afterwards. The match was supposed to be a two out of three falls match for the world championship. They went an hour. June Byers won a fall, but the referee called the match at the end of an hour, in part because people were just objecting to the thing continuing anymore. <laughs> so the thought was, well, she did not pin me. Burke's thought was she did not pin me two times in an hour. She pinned me one time. And so Burke is still the world champion. Um, but then Billy Wolf went into a high scale publicity campaign and declared that Byers was the world champion because she had won the only fall in the match. The wrestling press being the wrestling press went along with him. Uh, and in the advertisements, in the stories and so forth, Byers is proclaimed as the new champion, even though the stipulations of the match weren't met. It's, uh, it's a fascinating story because again, the, the match was not, nothing to to hang your hat on. If Burke would have resulted in something different, the story is that she said, well, that's okay. We still got two more falls to go. I'll go down for this fall and just uh, and, and try and catch up in the next two falls. And she never had the chance. So the story was by some that Mildred Burke said before the, the match, this is a shoot. So but I have a hard time believing that a 60 minute wrestling match was a shoot. And, but apparently they weren't working very well together because they did not like each other. So what was the, the real behind the scenes, what actually happened in the match as far as were they just not working together? Did they just not like each other? Did June Byers know that this uh, screw job was coming? We don't think that she knew the screw job was coming. They did not work particularly well together. Um, whether the match was a shoot, it's been advertised as a shoot in the, what, the 70 years since then. Whether it was a shoot or we're back to the Bruno thing where one of the wrestlers thought it was a shoot is probably an open question. But the descriptions of the match that I've read look like it was, if not a shoot, it was both guys were both gals were wrestling defensively and, and no action was happening. Uh, my friend Jeff Lean, who used to be an editor at the Washington Post, wrote a, a book on Mildred Burke. He was convinced that it was a shoot. Uh, he was working off Burke's own diaries and so forth. So from that perspective, she thought it was. I can't speak about buyers. Um, again, what we said earlier, it's tough to really know for sure if these double crosses were the real thing or were somewhat contrived. Either way, uh, it destroyed Burke. She retired about a year later and really paved the way for somebody else to take over the domain of women's wrestling and that being moolah yeah 
you, you, you said something, Steve, that really rang a bell with me. Uh, wondering if these stories are, are contrived or what, you know, because, you know, and both, uh, both of the bigger, bigger uh, screw jobs or double crosses always left the champion and out. Well, I just got beat one fall and we went 60 minutes, but I just got beat one <laughs> right. fall. I didn't get beat to two falls. So right. That kind of just throws a little bit more fuel in there. I mean, because it seemed like they were protected in some little stipulation and pro wrestling type. I think it's a great point, Mr. Briscoe, because uh, Strangler Lewis, for about the first 20 years of his career, anytime he lost a match, it was because, well, I was thrown over the top rope. Because I was thrown over the top rope, the guy should have been disqualified. Yeah. Or he uh, he used an illegal hold on me that was barred for that match. You know, yeah. any way to uh, to avoid a clean pin, one, two, three, and, right. and keep yourself strong. And I think you see a lot of that in in some of these double crosses. In particular, I said in, in the Londa Saboldi double cross, yeah. where he could say legitimately, you know, I, I I wasn't pinned and he had legions of followers to believe him. And you emerge from the situation, uh, if not stronger than before, at least as strong as you were going in. Right. It seemed to me like 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 the worst uh, so far we've discussed as far as destroying a talent was, was the two, Billy Two Rivers one and the George one. That seems like because he, he was basically destroyed after that, where all these others had, you know, somewhat of a career afterwards. Correct? I think so. You mean, you one, mean Don one, Eagle. You said Billy Don, Don Eagle. Yeah, Don I'm Eagle. sorry. Yeah, yeah. The one caveat we have to mention is the same thing you mentioned earlier, which is we don't know how many double crosses and screw jobs right. there were in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in, in smaller towns or tank towns or smaller venues that just kind of never got the attention of some of the bigger ones. I suspect there were a whole lot, and there were probably a lot of careers that were sidetracked or derailed by those kinds of things, too. But that's for us historians to try and find out. Well, I got a question for you about the athletic commissions, then. Are they just idiots? <laughs> yeah. Uh, or, or, are they, or are they crooks? That's because they're one of the two. I mean, they're either not regulating the sport. I put that in quotations. Are they're turning their head? Are they idiots? I mean, I don't see any positive thing that comes out about the athletic commissions during all this. Oh, that, that's probably true of athletic commissions then, and maybe true of athletic commissions now. <laughs> well, definitely is now because they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I got to is are the idiots, and Mr. Briscoe agreed. So it, I think that's probably the answer. So with the athletic commissions during that time, I mean, how do they save face and, and keep getting their payoffs? So essentially, I guess, is what they're worried about, right? Sure it is. Well, first of all, only a few states had athletic commissions at that time. You had New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, California, Missouri. That was about it for major states with athletic commissions. And they faced the same thing that they face today, which is, we don't really care what goes on in wrestling as long as we get our cut. <laughs> right. That's pretty yeah. much the athletic commissions yeah. uh, that we know, right, Mr. Briscoe? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, but, but back then, they seemed to, to work out a little bit closer together because if, if, say, one of these guys was, was barred in uh, in Missouri, he would be barred basically all over the country at the time. And that way, they sent to what the Western Union Telegraph uh, – Hey, we barred this guy. We appreciate you following our, our lead, right? Yeah, exactly. And then the degree to which the Athletic Commission had any significant teeth was a real question. Uh, in, uh, in 1930, the New York State Athletic Commission, just fed up with the whole situation, declared wrestling as an exhibition, not a sport. Well, the next year was the best year wrestling attendance ever had in New York City. <laughs> When and see, they, they blame Vince for all that. It was done, it was done in 1930. Yes, sir. When, when the Illinois Commission investigated Landis and Savoy, nothing came out of it. The commission were toothless then and probably a little bit toothless now. Well, see, let's go. I want to go to Ed Stranger Lewis. We got a couple more before we go to what I think. What I think is the big one. That's Wayne Munn and Zabisco in 1925. Oh. But Stranger Lewis and Ed Don George, April 13th, 1931. You mentioned Stranger Lewis, who was kind of the 
had taken over after maybe Hackenschmidt. And of course you had world war uh, one, you had the Spanish flu, you had a lot of things going on, you know, before a reason that wrestling kind of died after uh, Hackenschmidt and Gotch, but Stranger Lewis was the guy who was champion on and off throughout a lot of that. But then in 1931, you have this big uh, screw job. Uh, explain to us a little bit what happened. Uh, Stranger Lewis won a title. Stranger Lewis was jealous of Jim Landis and his success, and he wanted a title. Wrestling was splintered a little bit at that point, and there, uh, the, the what we used to call the AWA, not the current AWA or the AWA of the 60s, the old American Wrestling Association title had gone from Gus Sonnenberg in, in Boston uh, back and forth and ended up in the hands of Ed Don George, who was world champion of New England and California, if that constituted your world in 1930, <laughs> but it was a legitimate title. The long-term consequence of Lewis beating Ed Don George wasn't that long-term because Lewis lost the championship just a few weeks later in Montreal. It was more a matter of him trying to prove a point than anything else. Even so, it didn't affect Londis's popularity. Uh, he continued to rule the wrestling roost for the better part of another decade. But it did show that, as we talked about with some of the other double crosses and screw jobs, just pure animosity without any kind of long-term planning can explain a lot of what happened but there was also talk of a ed don george uh jim londos match that 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 got canceled because of this right that was going to be a what they claimed was going to be a hundred thousand dollar gate yeah it was that was a uh, by beating george lewis mucked up what was planned to be a big match between londos and ed don george they would ostensibly uh unify the world championship with these two different lines. The match probably would have resulted in a draw, just like yeah. Backlund and Race did down in Florida a few years yeah. back. But they were projecting the, a sellout of the, uh, uh, the the L.A. Coliseum for a giant match between Ed Don wow. George and Londis. That didn't occur until a few years later. So, yeah, Lewis messed up a lot of promoters' plans particularly Lou Darrell, the California promoter, who became more aligned with Londis as time went on. Well, what was the promotion back then? Was it, uh, was that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the time frame of the Dumont Network. Uh, what was, where where were they getting the promotion to sell out the LA Coliseum? Because obviously they were doing it for boxing too, you know, with Jack Johnson being a huge draw, Jack Dempsey being a huge draw, you know, without a lot of TV, all of a sudden, it was obviously through the sports pages. What was the big push for wrestling to sell out arenas around the, the country? Word of mouth, newspaper advertising, and to some extent, the movie reels that we used to see when we were kids going into the theater on a Saturday afternoon where they'd show what the five-minute movie tone news of the day, that would be your glimpse at Londis or Lewis or Renato Gardini or any of those guys. And, of course, once you saw just that little teeny piece in the movie theater, you said, man, I, I got to see those guys. Uh, so there was no blank, blank, to, you know, blank yeah. social media like there is today. And that but, sort of legitimized uh, the matches, too, by seeing them on those movie tone reels, right? Of course it did, because you're seeing those matches on the movie tone reel next to President Roosevelt or Winston Churchill or, you know, the, the effort in the war in, in World War II. And so it kind of gives you the effect of, hey, you know, all this is, is real and, and is, is, is part of one. And you, did you not have that much heel and baby face back then because you were just promoting an athletic competition? Or was there still some of that personality coming through in some of these reels to promote this is the bad guy? It was more of a subtle heel thing. Than anything else, Londis worked as a heel sometimes, but just the idea of an undersized guy was uh, was was the baby face. The primo carnera, the giant guy, was the heel because how can a guy who's six eight and three hundred pounds be a baby face? But there wasn't the 
closely identified thing that we would think of today in terms of a heel and the baby face. Maybe there was just a little punch to the kidney or maybe not a clean break, uh, but nothing that would, nothing we would think of today as a traditional heel or a traditional baby face. It was two guys going at each other. Maybe one was a little rougher than the other and you definitely had your cheering section, but you also had, and this was important at the time, uh, a lot of ethnic folks right. in attendance. I was, I was going to ask that. Was a lot of it the ethnic uh, draw, you know, just like when, especially when Bruno came up in, in uh, New York, there was a, you know, that, that ethnic draw is what made him a star up there, really. Sure, it really was. A lot of this, it was Greek fans yeah. uh, with, with Raka. Raka, was, yeah, same. It was, his, it was Hispanic fans. There's a long line uh, that goes back and traces the ethnic fans in wrestling. One of the points that I made in the Londis book that we'll eventually discuss another day was Londis was the first immigrant athletic superstar in any sport. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Newt Rockney came from Norway and was big in football. John L. Sullivan was the Irish hero in Boston. He was born in Boston, though. Londis was the first guy in a major American sport to come from overseas and become an immigrant superstar. And then with that came the blue collar fans the ethnic fans, because he had a certain appeal to them that the big, strapping, all-American, Midwest, red corpuscled farm boys didn't have. They might have had that in the Midwest, but they didn't have that on the coasts. No. You, know, you, know, you know, something that I found interesting during this conversation is, you know, we, we just touched real lightly on these huge mega houses that they had back then. $100,000 houses would probably equivalent to about 5 or $6 million nowadays. But uh, you know, drawing fifty thousand people uh, uh, selling out the coliseums, how how frequent were those, and 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 were they coordinated throughout the United States through na national media? Because there were no media other than the newspaper at that time. So, and, and did promoters cooperate? And how how frequent would would they run a big one like a series of them in, in Chicago, New York, and L.A. or something like that? How frequent were these things? New York. Chicago, L.A., Philadelphia would run one or two outdoor shows every year at a baseball stadium and draw fifteen or 20,000 people. Uh, you didn't have quite the plotting out of a long-term program that you had today. As far as attendance, I can tell you because I was working on this on the other day. From 1926 to 1934, Londis wrestled in front of crowds of 10,000 plus 62 times. Wow. <laughs> the the, the runner-up runner -up was 16, 16 times, Gus Sonnenberg, okay? Wow. Sonnenberg, okay. So, yeah, so to get to what your point was, yeah, this is all across the country. They're not necessarily connected, but they do understand that if this guy has done well here, by word of mouth through, oh, a Greek organization, we're going to bring him in here and he's going to have a big reception here or word of mouth through some Italian fraternal organization. We're going to bring him in here. Uh, so there was a sense that there was a, a, a national sport. Londis made it a national sport. It fell apart after that for various reasons. Uh, but the degree to which he drew people night after night was just amazing. It, 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 as long as one of you compared or, or, or put a comparison out there with Hogan and uh, the importance of Londis's career with Hogan and Andre, or, or is it, was it somebody else? I I did it, uh, Mr. Briscoe, and in, in the Heroes book, I wrote specifically, it's it's not accurate to say Jim Londis was the Hulk Hogan of his day. Hulk Hogan was the Jim Londis of his day. Okay, all right, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and that's a that's a really good analogy. Because business just business took off in the 30s, business took off in the 80s around a single identifiable guy, uh, and took wrestling to places it had never been before, and most importantly, made wrestling acceptable wow. to the mainstream. It was no longer a guilty pleasure, okay? Yeah. 
Okay. Now, what 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 did what what made it a guilty pleasure in the in the beginning? Now, the thirties. Let's just take a, a, this a stepping stone from the thirty. Prior to the thirties, the business was looked on kind of like it was in in a in the sixties or fifties or sixties, and then then Londis came along and 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 kind of purified the sport. And then when it what what was it that made it change back? Was it was it uh, the Pfeffer, Jack Pfeffer uh, article in the New York Times that exposed everything? What kind of turned the tide back to? Well, this stuff is lowbrow. More than anything, it was another double cross, another and that was the that was the Dick Sheikat Dano O'Mahony okay. double cross okay. in Madison Square Garden thirty six mm-hmm. when Sheikat just plain shot on O'Mahony, oh. took the championship. Went and sold it to the highest bidder, got sued. Wrestling ended up in federal court in Columbus, Ohio. Wrestling shouldn't be in federal court. That's not a good place for it to be because you're swearing, <laughs> yeah. you're swearing that this is true. Yeah. Uh, the whole sport just fell apart. And I think within a within three or four months, you had eight or nine different world champions. Right. And wrestling suddenly became a regionalized sport with a champ, a world champion in California, a world champion in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Is this, is this advent of TV? I mean, is it TV cause uh, it? Uh, we're still we're still a few years well, ahead. Still of pre-TV, TV. okay. Yeah, but there's just uh, I call it the Balkanization of wrestling. It oh. just it ended up looking like the Balkans. Right. Uh, when the the trial started in federal court in columbus ohio in 1936 a lot of wrestlers exposed the business okay they had to they said you know i was forced to to throw this match uh or this person made me put down the deed on my house to guarantee that i could get a match with so forth and so on and of course the press had just had a field day with that dan parker among them which just about everybody um thought wrestling was terribly, terribly sullied from about 36 on. And it's not until it was sort of reinvented around the TV era is a very different kind of sport that it got back in people's houses. And then on Mahoney was, he was what a shot putter in the Olympics, but he wasn't a shooter. So he was a big, tough athlete, but he wasn't, wasn't a shooter. Right. And that was the reason that uh, shit got knew he could, knew he could take him and wanted to take him. There was a little bit of jealousy there. Well, O'Mahony, O'Mahony actually was pronounced in Ireland, but O'Mahony was a, a, a find of Paul Bowser in Boston, in Ireland. Londis was getting tired, and Londis was ready to give up the title for some to somebody. So the thought was, well, Greek? Oh, no, let's go Irish, okay? Let's bring this guy over from Ireland to Boston. Boy, he'll set the world on fire. He got a push in Boston that would have made Goldberg envious, okay? Mm-hmm. Had some athletic ability had no real wrestling skill. Uh, so almost as soon as he won the world championship, guys like Dick Sheikad and others just sort of, hmm, boy, I can take this guy anytime and maybe claim that $200,000 that's sitting there uh, for the world championship. So almost from the time O'Mahony won the championship in 36, uh, 35 rather, he was constantly on guard about being double-crossed, suffering a screw job ending, Finally, SheCat did it after a couple other folks had tried in 36. They did it again in Madison Square Garden. SheCat locked him in a hammer lock, a, a real hammer lock, and told him, you know, I'm not going to break this kid until you give up. And O'Mahony turned to the referee and said, uh, stop the match. He's killing me. Now, what do you do if you're a referee in that situation? And you've got an unexpected outcome. You say, Nah, he's just saying that to impress the people at ring said that he's really in pain. Or do you say, I I think he's actually killing him. I better stop this uh, match. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, uh, there's a difficult call, but they stop the match. Right. Yeah. So how wh- why did it end up in federal court? What was um, it was it the athletic commission suing the, the wrestlers? How did it end up there? It was really a complicated thing, but in short. SheCat was allowed, alleged to have signed a contract with a sub-promoter in Boston who worked for Paul Bowser. O'Mahony was Bowser's man. Bowser and his subcontractor sued SheCat for selling the world title without his permission. Okay? 
breaking the contract, she kept started working with Al Haft. Again, this this circle of guys, they all they were at each other's throats all the time. So in the discovery phase of the trial in federal court, she cat is testifying. Yeah, I double crossed them by throwing O'Mahony. Um, I was told to throw Londis in five minutes. I threw him in 10 minutes instead. A variety of wrestlers and promoters came in and started talking about instances in which they were told intentionally to go lose a match. Within a few months, there were more exposés in other places about wrestlers who had been told they had to lose a match. There was a report that when Stanislaw Sabisco beat Wayne Munn, which we'll get to, uh, he was paid $50,000 by the Joe Stecker camp to do that. It got really, really unseemly even for rest, even by wrestling standards. <laughs> yeah. And it, it really killed off the game. The idea of a national storyline with a national champion was gone. You had several different promotions. Uh, after she cat beat O'Mahony, she cat dropped the title to a gentleman named Ali Baba. Ali Baba was double crossed in New York by Dave Levin. Dave Levin lost the title to Dean Denton. Uh, it was almost too dizzying to be able to keep track of. We laugh now at wrestling because we're in this, we, we were in this period, not so much now, but we were in this period where titles were changing on a weekly basis. We couldn't figure out who was uh, uh, the title holder at any given time. Whoever was running into the ring with a bag of money was claiming a title. No, all this was done in the 30s, <laughs> except then... <laughs> It was casting aspersions on what people had thought was, if not a legitimate, at least a semi-respectable business. And before we get to Wayne and uh, Zabisco, uh, Wayne Wayne Munn and Zabisco, was it Gorgeous George that helped, and of course television, after World War II, that helped bring back wrestling from this kind of this dark period after this federal trial with this crew job? Yeah, it, the, the TV really helped a lot. Uh, when TV first appeared, wrestling was perfect. It didn't require much camera work, right? You had clearly identifiable good guys and bad guys. People could bleach their hair just in case you couldn't tell the difference. You had wilder characters than you'd ever seen before. Remember when we're talking about the era of Jim Landis and Ed Lewis and Gus Sonnenberg, these guys were not getting on the mic and delivering five minute soliloquies about how great they were and how they were going to trash somebody next week in Dayton, Ohio. There was no such thing. But when wrestling started to go on TV and these guys, you could actually hear them talk, right? You could hear them express themselves. You could hear Buddy Rogers say to a nicer guy, it couldn't happen. One of the best heel promos ever. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that took wrestling in an entirely different direction and put it on, I mean, it's been up and down since then, but put it on a sound footing that it hadn't had since it lost the legitimacy it had in the mid-30s. And, and also on, on, on behalf of the TV, uh, they uh, they always put like a, like a not, a, not a superstar commentator, you know, like the, the Dennis James is it on a, People like that. I mean, even David Letterman started out as, as a wrestling tale. But they always had a personality, it seemed like, that, and then they, 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 you list us some of the commentary, and it was really good for that time and age, too. Yeah, we did a story yeah. on Dennis James in our storytellers book, and I was thrilled to be able to do that because I had always thought of him as host of the nighttime prices right. Right, yeah, exactly. But he, through his commentary, was not only clever and thoughtful, it was aimed at women. Mm -hmm. The guys are going to watch this stuff, but he knew if he could get the women involved too then you're reaching a whole new demographic that you didn't have maybe in the 20s or the 30s or the 40s. It's was very slick, uh, yeah. and it was much more packaged than ever before. This heyday of Jim Lana's, before we get to the, the Munn uh, and Zab Zabisco screw job, was you had a lot of people coming in from different sports. So you had Bronco Nagurski coming in. The match that I was talking about with uh, – I'm sorry – 
Bronco Nagurski was Max Bear was the referee. Uh, you had uh, Primo Canera. After that, you had Joe Lewis. I mean, was it just the money, and was it Londos that created this atmosphere where these stars? I mean, incredible stars. You know, you had, you had real stars back then in our nation. You know, you look at Murderer's Row and the Yankees. You know, people to this day remember that. People to this day remember all these names that I just mentioned. They were all wanting to be part of professional wrestling. Was that mainly Jim Londos and his popularity that brought that and brought the other stars into the business? A rising tide lifts all boats, right? Yeah. yeah. You look at the look at the number of football players who went into wrestling at that time. We mentioned Joe Ciboldi, All-American at Notre Dame, played for a little while for the Chicago Bears, walked away saying, you know, I can make more money in wrestling and get my head beat in way less often if I go into the wrestling business. Stayed in the wrestling business and became a big star. Gus Sonnenberg, All-American football player at Dartmouth. Jim McMillan, University of Illinois. Uh, the, the crossover was extremely strong because you could make more money wrestling. You didn't get hurt if you had some idea of what you were doing. In fact, I, I don't have this in the book, John, but Jim Landis advised, um, I think it was, it was Franklin Roosevelt Jr. It was one of the Roosevelts mm. who was trying to decide whether to go into football or wrestling. Landis said, you, choose wrestling. It's You're not going to get hurt nearly as much, you know. If you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you saw that you saw a massive influx from other sports. Um, Art Shires was a baseball player who ended up in wrestling. Part of that was the fact that the football player in those times worked only part of the year, right? Yeah. Maybe 13, 15 weeks. And that was his salary. Wrestling went all year round, 365 days a year. You could do both. You know, you you could supplement your football salary by wrestling the other six, eight, nine months a year. And so you saw an influx of uh, of athletes from other sports become wrestlers, if only for a period of time. And when they came in, of course, they had the marquee value of having played in another sport. And so, you know, you could kind of tap into that. Football fans, you remember Jim McMillan from the University of Illinois? He'll be here wrestling this Friday night. All you Illini, get out there and support your guy. Right. Well, then let's get to uh, what I think is uh, one of my most interesting uh, screw job, Wayne Munn versus Stanislaus Zabisco, May 15th, 1925, because of all of the interaction that is going on at this time, from Joe Stetcher on one side and Stanislaus Zabisco to the Gold Dust Trio that had really changed wrestling and really wanted to make wrestling into more of a showmanship, especially behind Toots Mont. And yeah. uh, you had this Wayne Munn, who was this big, tall, really good-looking guy, but not a shooter and, and not a wrestler. Maybe been a tough guy, but not a wrestler. Stanislaw Sabisco, completely just the opposite. Who, by the way, I just read on the internet, which is always right, trained uh, Johnny Valentine and Harley Race. Uh, wow. Absolutely. Yep. Down in South America. I did not know that, <laughs> No wonder those yeah. are so mean and tough. So, but tell us about this screw job with uh, Wayne Munn and Stanislaw Sabisco, 1925. This had its genesis, again, going back to Strangler Lewis and his manager, Billy Sandow. They had gone through the field of competition and didn't want to give another title shot to a Landis or a John Pesek or somebody who might actually present a real challenge to them. Yeah. So they are going to the outside and creating their own challenger. And they selected a football player from the University of Nebraska, hey, another football player, mm -hmm. named Wayne Munn, built him up, trained him over the course of time. Billy Sandow managed both men, which, you know, if that's not a conflict of interest, even in wrestling, mm -hmm. I don't know what is. And Munn defeated Lewis. Oh, wait, wait a minute, Steve. Let's this is kind of different. A manager. We're not talking like a Bobby the Brain Hina type. We're talking like a business manager, right? Or, or uh, actually, actually, he was both. He was he was Bobby the Brain Heenan and a business manager all rolled okay. up in one. Okay. Um, 
Bobby Heenan or Gary Hart or Sir Oliver Humperdinck all would have taken good lessons from the way Billy Sandow attacked his opponent and how his man actually had never been pinned and how Strangler Lewis, my man, his headlock is the most feared hold in the world. It can bring a horse to its knees. Now, you know, I don't know what horse they were talking about. <laughs> I feel I feel bad for Mr. Ed. So he, but he managed both the business affairs and sort of the ringside activities of Ed Lewis. Uh, anyway, they settled on Wayne Munn, a, a former Nebraska football player, as a guy that they would prop up as a challenger to Lewis. Um, he was trained for a little while, and he defeated Lewis in another one of these controversial endings where he'd thrown Lewis out of the ring. You weren't supposed to throw somebody out of the ring. This was not fair. Sandow protests. Lewis should still be the champion. But, you know, what the heck. Uh, Munn couldn't defend himself. I, I, he really wasn't any kind of athlete in terms of a combat sport. What Lewis and Sandow were building up to was a big outdoor show in Michigan City, Indiana. They even had a site picked out where they were looking for wrestling's first $100,000 gate, where the good-looking champion would square off against Lewis trying to regain his championship. He would, and wrestling would go back to normal. There was only pro one problem uh, with that scheme. It's one of those things that's brilliant in its simplicity, but when it gets to its actual execution, eh, it stinks. Stanislaw Sabisco, the old-time Polish wrestler, uh, uh, Alanda's favorite, by the way, was scheduled to meet uh, Wayne Munn in Philadelphia. Sabisco was an old-time protective of the business traditionalist. And he didn't like the idea of going over to somebody, uh, going down to somebody who had no experience in wrestling and was there just as a box office magnet. He got in the ring with Wayne Munn and wiped the floor with him in two straight falls. At ringside, one of the managers for Munn is yelling, oh, Zabisco's double crossing us. Stop this. Turn off the lights. Do anything to stop <laughs> it. You know? <laughs> it just so happened that the gentleman's name was Ed White, who figures on later on in the Lanza story. But they recognized what was going on at the time. What they didn't recognize was that Zabisco was paid an estimated $50,000 wow. by, by Joe Stecker and Joe Stecker's camp. And a few weeks later, Zabisco quietly lost his title back to Joe Stecker. And now Lewis is out whatever he would have made at that big match in Michigan City, Indiana. Munn has been exposed as a non-entity. And Lewis is was never comfortable working in the in the ring with Stecker because Stecker was probably more of a shooter than Lewis actually was. Wow. So it was a it was a double cross that really wrecked Lewis's plans. And at that time sort of transferred the power in wrestling more toward the Stecker, Landis, Jack Curley uh, continuum. It was probably one of the five or six most consequential matches of the first half of the 20th century. Wow. That is something. Yeah. It, so uh, Zabisco obviously paid off by Stetcher. Did Stetcher ever end up working? And who did, who did, did Stetcher ever end up working with Lewis? Yeah, they did. They had a few matches, and Stetcher actually dropped the title to Lewis at one point when so he it, got when he got tired and didn't want to wrestle anymore. That's that. That's what I was trying to get at because I, I was thinking that was right. Because again, I read it on the internet, so it has to be right. Um, yeah. The Stetcher eventually worked out a deal with Lewis and just said, "Okay, I'm gonna do it for." Him. So Stetcher was just all about the money. He wanted he wanted <laughs> the title, and he's gonna make money off of it. And then eventually he's got to drop it to somebody. He's going to make money off that too, right? And that's why he... That's exactly right. And then he he went to his farm, took the money, went and built up his farm. Unfortunately, he lost all the money in the Depression and had to come back after the Depression and work again. But again, that's a, a whole other story. It's, a, it's, it's fascinating, though, to think that he was willing to use an intermediary to beat Munn. You had to do that. If Stitcher had actually gotten in there against Munn, well... Lewis and Sandow would never have let Stetcher fight Munn to begin with. 
There Why did they first... think that Zabisco would would not do this? He had never done this before. I mean, Zabisco was a former strongman, a, one of the toughest guys in wrestling history. Why do they not think Zabisco might do this? I think the only thing people can look at in history is think they were just so full of themselves they didn't think it could happen. Huh. 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 Um, you know, you guys know from your experience in wrestling, it's always a good idea to look over your shoulder and see if somebody's gaining on you. If you get a little bit arrogant about that and forget to look over your shoulder, that's when somebody starts to gain on you. You mentioned were, uh, you mentioned Pesic. Pesic was one of the, I've always heard Pesic was one of the greatest shooters of all time, and uh, he was the real policeman behind the scenes in a lot of different places. Yeah, everybody agrees that nobody wanted to get in and shoot with Pesic. That, that was <laughs> they were asking for it. Could um, he not? Could he not draw money? Why was he not ever a uh, champion? I mean, like, one of the toughest guys. Why, why was he not in a world of tough men at that time? It was very important. Too busy raising greyhounds. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had other interests. Yeah. Uh, he didn't particularly care for that schedule. He had other interests back in the the Nebraska farm. Mm -hmm. He got along pretty well with everyone. I wanted to add this on the the, the Mun quote. Um, it was so obvious that Munn was not capable of defending himself. This was from Jack Curley, the promoter in New York. Quote, right. I know of 10 wrestlers who will give Munn $10,000 to meet him, and they will donate an extra $5,000 to charity if they do not throw him twice in 30 minutes. Huh. So here was, here was a duck just asking to be cooked. Right. Uh, cooked he was, and it really altered the equation in, in pro wrestling probably for about five or six years until the Londis era began around 1930. And this really hurt the gold dust trio, right? Yeah, it did. It, 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 it took the power out of Lewis and Sandow in particular were never as powerful after that. Um, Steve Yoey, who is one of my fellow historians calls this Mun situation, the biggest mistake in the history of wrestling, which covers a lot of ground. Right. And Toots, though, Toots kind of survived this, right? Because he ended up being later part of working with WWWF, and Toots had a lot of things. Toots seemed like a survivor to me. Yeah, Toots, Toots was uh, – um, I think I wrote something like Toots was a, was a cockroach, and he would have appreciated that analogy. He managed <laughs> to survive from the 20s really into the 70s, always alienating people, but somehow coming back on top to get a piece of the action. Toots was uh, in with Lewis. Toots was manager for a while of Dick Sheikat. Toots and Londis were allied, allied for several years, even though Toots tried to screw Londis. <laughs> Toots and Raka, well, Toots had a piece of Raka, a large piece of Raka, and on and on. It's amazing how these guys can survive um, Again, I go back to Lou Thez. Thez said Toots was made for wrestling and wrestling was made for Toots. And Toots later ended up working with Vince McMahon Sr., right? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Toots did that. Toots uh, ended up running Pittsburgh. Back. This is before Bruno, but back when Crusher was on top in Pittsburgh, drawing really big money there, Crusher and Buddy Rogers in Pittsburgh. Um, and then eventually Bruno brought the, brought the Pittsburgh promotion for himself. So he had an expansive reach. He would be another fascinating story. The problem is, like with a lot of wrestling, you can't tell the truth from the picture. <laughs> it's funny how that happens. Uh, there's a problem with I wrestling. watch some of these old podcasts, and, and Mr. Briscoe and I, we try our very best to be as honest as possible. You know, we remember stories that are 30 years old and older. You remember your, your perspective, and you try to get it right, but a lot of times you uh -huh. don't, but not on purpose. But I see I see a lot of people doing interviews going, that didn't happen. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of it is on purpose. I'm you know, some of it, I think it's just misremembering some of it. I, I, I'm saying stuff today, John, that I was there that I don't think happened. I mean, a big story on, you know, that coming up on the, on, on all the social media forums today that 
I don't want to mention publicly because everybody will come down on me saying I'm jealous and all that stuff. But <laughs> yeah, I said, I, you know, I was in the locker room with him for 12 hours the night after this supposedly happened, and he was very close to us, and none of that ever come up, you know. And <laughs> I just don't, I don't see that. But yeah, I, my question is, and Steve, and, and it's kind of, kind of all off, but it kind of follows too. You know, the the, the golden era, they call it, TV coming out. How long did that Dumont era last? You know, I mean, was it a prolonged deal, or was it did it kind of just come and go? Because that was that was where all the power was was being formed at that time. It was it was really about a four or five year period from about 1948 to the early 1950s when television started to go in a different direction. You know, we all know wrestling is cyclical, and you can just kind of have your fill of it so much before you turn the channel and do something else. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the golden TV era lasted about three or four years. And then we started to split into the territorial era where instead of a national television show, we had, everybody had their own local TV shows and their own local champions, um, which is the way most of us remember wrestling from the 50, probably probably from the fifties to probably about, oh, the day Hogan beat Iron Sheik. Uh, and renationalized uh, the sport. Yeah, they believe now wrestling didn't start until 1983. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that amazing, though? I mean, you think, people talk about the Attitude Era. It, it wasn't but three or four years, uh, yeah. you know, or five, whatever it was. It wasn't that long. You know, you talk about the, the Dumont era, and people all know about that. There's a golden era, yeah. Yeah. but it wasn't that long. You know, a lot of these eras were not like 15, 20 years yeah. long. You know, they were very short because a lot of times it depended on who's on top. And that's that's a very finite amount of time that a, that a guy can stay on top, you know, unless you're Hogan or, or The Rock. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. You know, wrestling is cyclical. We had that period in the mid-80s where it went boom through the roof. But then by the early 90s, you know, we're we're in the cellar again. Wow. It's It's amazing how that happens. And I think, John, you're right. I think it depends on making sure you have a star, a single name who's easily identifiable with the public. It might be Strangler Lewis. It might be Londis. It might be Luthez. Um, It might be Ric Flair, who in retirement is more popular than he ever was when he was actually wrestling and more well-known than he was when he was actually wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't take anything away from his wonderful career, but he he's oh. he's done so much since he's out. He's on everything. He's on he's every he's, he's, he's like everywhere. Spud, like Spud Monroe used to say, "Tell me all the time, kid, I'm like Coca Cola. I'm everywhere." That's Ric <laughs> Flair today. He's everywhere. <laughs> Steve, what happened to Wayne Munn? Uh, he wrestled for a couple more years and went into boxing and died at an early age. Wow, I wish I. I wish I could have a more positive thing than that, but um, the story of these guys who are double-crossed, who had no real wrestling skills, Dana O'Mahony would fall in the same category, is that they really had nothing else to fall back on. They wrestled a little bit. They made some money. Um, they O'Mahony also died at an early age of, a, of an accident. Um, they're forgotten. And although they were immensely popular for a very brief period of time, the the epitaph, the obituary, the headline is the guy was a tool used as part of a double cross to get somebody else over. Wow. You know, know, that's uh, that's something, too, that, you know, a lot of the boxers at at, at that golden age, they they had a life afterward. It doesn't seem like the wrestlers really had that opportunity to to be a you know a greeter or or, or a spokesman for a company kind of sort of like the boxers did is that true? Yeah, that's true. It's not until you got into the TV age that you could have wrestlers endorse things yeah. on a regular basis. Um, there weren't there weren't promotional opportunities available then. What wrestlers would do to make income in the 1910s and 1920s was betting. Mm-hmm. That's where the, the money came from there. And later on, the 20s and 30s, you do posing exhibitions or you do an exhibition at a local theater or a meet and greet. Or you do a workout at the YMCA and pay have people pay two or three bucks to come and see you. Um, you didn't endorse mortgage companies or Carfax 
or pistachios or the things uh, that we see. Slam down, uh, baby. <laughs> yeah. The, or ice cream bars are the yeah. things that we see people endorse today. You know, guys didn't make a lot of money. And that's why uh, you had a period in the 30s and 40s and 50s where a lot of wrestlers died without anything in their pocket. If we can put in a club a plug for Cauliflower Alley, the Cauliflower Alley yeah, Club has for, come for to sure. the assistance of so many wrestlers these days who uh, have financial problems. You just wish it had been ex it been in existence back in the in the thirties. Well, 30s. well the, the guys that formed CAC originally they were from that era and that, that they saw a need for for that and it, it is a wonderful organization and uh, people work very hard hard to to, to keep that thing continued, but. And that's how Lou and and, and uh, Carl and a lot of those old guys that founded that thing was 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 it was a uh, for to help uh, help old older wrestlers transition, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And at that time too, to again your point, Mister Briscoe, it was also uh, uh, wrestlers and movie stars and boxers, all of who had the same fate that once their playing or acting days were over, they they needed a little bit of a helping hand. Yeah, and I've seen firsthand uh, this past year what Cauliflower Alley has done for some really close, couple of close, real close friends of mine, uh, wrestlers that needed needed something. Man, it is a wonderful thing that they do. You know, Brian Blair is uh, that that man's got a heart of gold, yeah, and so does Cauliflower Alley Club. They uh -huh. they do wonderful work with old wrestlers. So if you ever think about giving money to Cauliflower Alley Club, you wonder if it goes to help old wrestlers. I can tell you personally, that's exactly where it goes. It's yeah, it goes the right place. He goes to the right place. So you you mentioned before we go, you mentioned uh, most consequential matches. It was like one of five or six, you know, the, the Mun versus Zabisco, and it just kind of piqued my interest since you're the the wrestling historian. And uh, the, what what what's your most consequential match? Say of the first fifty years of the last century, or whatever era you choose from, or, or say your first couple. You don't have to limit it to just one. Maybe a couple or three, whatever you want. I'll just give you a couple. First of all, the match that propelled wrestling to new heights in North America was Gotch and Hackenschmidt in Chicago. Right. That's that's kind of the dawn of wrestling in, in the United States. Now, wrestling petered out pretty quickly after that, but that was the first match that drew a mass crowd of 30,000 people in Chicago. In far as far as impact on the business, I think we mentioned a couple of them here already. I think O'Mahony and Shecat had an enormous effect on the business, even though it was a lousy match. Bruno and Rogers had an enormous effect on the business, even though it was, you know, if you took a sip from your Coke, you probably missed the match. Yeah. Hogan and Iron Sheik was not a classic, but it had an enormous effect on the business. And from what we're talking about here, this era, I would say Strangler Lewis and Jim Londis in Chicago in 1934 which drew the largest North American crowd at that point, 36,000 and came up just short of a hundred thousand dollar gate was a match that put wrestling on a solid footing, at least for a period of time. I would say, you know, people are going to have their favorite matches. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mention the Gerald Briscoe match in there too. I'm not, <laughs> they were all important. Hey, I helped train Abe Lincoln. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what I, what I forgot, but I think those are historically significant matches. If you're looking at a match that had impact on the business, right? That's what I was. I was just interested. It piqued my interest. So what yeah, we did. Well, 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 Steve, what 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 drove you to become a wrestling historian? Out of all the things out there, you're a very accomplished writer, very Good skillful question. writer. What 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 was your what was your 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 passion when you when you were growing up? Who did you see that kind of inspired you? Well, I grew up. John was here. I think when I gave that little speech a couple of years ago. I grew up in Western New York. We used to get Buffalo TV, Pittsburgh TV, New York TV, Toronto TV, and Vancouver TV. So I was exposed to all these different wow. things when I was a kid, which was exciting because I could watch WWWF. I could watch Sheik. I could watch Johnny Powers. I could watch Gene Kaniski and Don Leo Jonathan. So that just kind of whetted my appetite. Uh, and about the only trade, about the only tool I have in my tool chest is an ability to string sentences together. Uh -huh. okay? So you take wrestling with its natural storylines and a kid who could write, and that's kind of where it got involved in that. Um, the other aspect of that is in real life, I've been a reporter. 
newspaper and magazine reporter and writer for years and years. And so I have an absolute determination to report things factually and accurately. Okay. In wrestling? In wrestling business. <laughs> That's right. So in wrestling, boy, what a challenge this is. I, I, I accept this challenge of trying to find the facts and the truth behind the stories in wrestling, if only for my own edification, but also to set the record straight. Not every match was a sellout. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hanging from the rafters. Hey, 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 it was not, not every, every every match was for the title. It was for the title, it was a sellout. You know, they're hanging from the rafters. Went over, you know. Hanging from not, the rafters. Not this every match was crazy. A, not every match was a five star match. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I've always i've I've said this, guys, and I'm convinced about this. Wrestling is great. It's great on its own. You don't need the embellishment. <laughs> There's so many rich stories and so many things we can talk about without the exaggeration. Oh, you're right. You know, you know, and, and you, you know what? I don't mean. I'm sorry to cut you off. Steve. You know, it's it's so funny because sometimes people ask me, you know, that that, that you know aren't know anything about wrestling. Tell me some old wrestling stories, and I'll start telling them some stories, and and I'm telling them mild stories, and they're looking at me like, I don't believe you. And I'm like, why why would I lie about this? I'm not telling you the bad stuff. I'm telling you like the the home version of a safe story, and you think yeah. this is crazy. You have no idea. Uh, but like I said before, you know, if we get if we get the history right, I think that's a big deal. We we have a better idea of where we're going. Um, I think that's not just true of wrestling, but it's true of you know, baseball and politics and religion and anything else that we want to argue about. Steve, what is? Let's take uh, Jim Londos out of the equation because that's your book coming up. So take take it uh, out of the equation so you don't have so you don't feel compelled to talk about Jim Londos. <laughs> I, you know, that I think it's my favorite topic. Other than Jim Londos, which is your book coming out, which I can't wait to finish reading and write the forward for, uh, what is your favorite topic that you've written about in wrestling? Our favorite person, our favorite event? I did I did that in the storytellers, and this is one where I could have written about five thousand words, but I had to keep it short because you know we had to keep the price of the book relatively affordable, and that is Doctor Sam Shepard, the mm -hmm. original fugitive. Yeah. Going into pro wrestling. And, um, you know, the guy who ostensibly murdered his wife um, with the one-armed man and everything else. Right. And it, it, it was just recent enough in the, the late 60s and early 70s that I was able to find folks who actually worked with him in the ring. Um, Mr. Briscoe, one of them was our old friend Joe Hamilton. Wow. Really? And, and he, went, he went on at length about what it was like to work with the most infamous alleged criminal of his day. Um, I went to Ohio and found a, a fellow who worked with Dr. Sam Shepard in his very first match when the TV cameras were all there from CBS and NBC profiling this guy who had ostensibly murdered his wife, this great physician, but now he was going to be a pro wrestler. Uh -huh. oh, what a, what a ready-made story that is. Um, it was a fascinating piece. Our friend Jeff Walton from California, from the LA office, drove Sam Shepard around a little bit in uh, wow. when he was in California. And I, I got a great chance to talk to Jeff. And here we are 50 or 60 years later, and he's still shaking his head like this. And I can't <laughs> believe the things that this guy did. Um, that was great to be able to record that for posterity. Wow. Um through the through the eyes of guys who'd actually worked with him, it's a, it was, the, it was. What was what was he like? What was Sam Shepard like? He's an asshole. asshole. Really? <laughs> Johnny Jeff was Wolf. a doctor that murdered his wife. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, 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 Jeff Walton, our friend Jeff Walton in California, longtime publicist uh, for Mike LaBelle in the LA office, yeah. said, and I'm I'm not quoting now, but it was paraphrasing, said something like. Um, you know, after three days with this guy, I was convinced he killed his wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I, I it's all it. and uh, he, 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 before mankind used the mandible claw, right. Sam Shepard was using that also, that finger down the throat right. thing. And uh, as his finisher, what a great he, tidbit. 
<laughs> it was. He was using the finisher, the, the fingers down the throat to apply pressure on the throat or whatever the, the idea was. And I asked Joe a medical Ham doctor, he knew. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. That's, that was the idea. And I asked Joe Hamilton if he tried that. On, and then Joe said, no, I would have bitten his fingers off. <laughs> <laughs> Joe wanted to. <laughs> yeah. I just, I was so proud of myself the other day. I found out that, uh, and forgive me because I'm slow. I'm from, from the South. Buford well, Pusser was a failed wrestler. That's I didn't right. know that. And uh, Mr. Briscoe said, yeah, he was the shits. <laughs> 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 that ruined it. <laughs> But for those that are listening, Walking Tall, Buford Pusser was a, right. was a wrestler. Hey, well, Steve, <laughs> hey, uh, can I thank you enough uh, for coming on? We kept you forever, and I apologize, but that's because we're just interested in what you're saying. Uh, it's been oh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's just the delight. I'm sorry for the internet connection there. I think the storm has passed, and we seem to be doing better now. It's about the first, like, 45 minutes, about, and I'll try to end up. For a whole year, my internet was bad. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Uh, no, I appreciate it, guys, because uh, you guys have always been square shooters. Believe it or not, there's some wrestlers that I've interviewed in my day where I didn't think I was getting the full and complete accurate story, not to mention Mark Lewin's name in here. But oh, wow. <laughs> I love Marky, too. <laughs> Mark was a big influence on me. I spent a year with him in Australia, and I, I love the guy. He's he's another guy that uh, uh, I did a I did a quote unquote shoot interview with him a few years ago. I'm not sure how much of a shoot it was, but it was it was fun. I bet it was. Marky <laughs> Marky Marky can enhance a few stories. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I I think he tread lightly around some of the major issues, but we get, we got a pretty entertaining production out of it. <laughs> yeah, now imagine I, I'm a basically a rookie out of Oklahoma. I hadn't been out of Oklahoma except maybe to Japan for like four or five six weeks. And I get a trip to Australia, and there's Gary Hart, there's Don Jardine, and there's uh, King Curtis. And who do I end up with palling with those guys there? Huh. <laughs> I got an education early. <laughs> I bet you did. Well, Steve, thank you uh, again. And uh, your your book about Jim Londos, when is it coming out? How do you buy it and all that stuff? Uh, we're anticipating first quarter of next year. Oh, great. Um, Ought to have a ought to have it nailed down here within a few months. I'm working on some edits for it right now and uh, collecting some images. Um, the usual sources, Amazon. You know, if it's not in your bookstore, call your bookstore and tell you tell them we need it. Hey, and uh, give a list if you don't mind of, of, of several of the books that you've written. I gave, I mentioned a couple at the front. That way, people that uh, are watching this can uh, pick that pick those up if they want to. Oh, sure. It's it's the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame series with Greg Oliver and Mr. Briscoe's helped so much with that. But uh, History of the Heels, History of Heroes and Icons, which was our term for baby yeah, faces. History of the Field. Uh, uh, that Don Field and all those guys. Oh, Heels, yeah. Mr. Briscoe. Yeah, would oh, you put uh, your... What, what is wrong with you? I sure. can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. He's from Virginia, too. He got that accent. Right. Hey, don't blame it on him. <laughs> Uh, he, in essence, heels, heroes, tag teams. We wrote the one and only book on tag teams. Uh, Storytellers. That was the favorite book that we did. It's it's still in print and not very old. I love uh, that one. I love that book. Yeah. Great book. It is. Uh, you know, there's. Uh, I, I will say this: there's not a lot of money in it, but boy, there's a lot of joy in being able to tell stories like Sam Shepard or or Jim oh. Lantis or. Or Gerald Briscoe or anything like that. <laughs> Thank you. What 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 unless you put me at Sam Shepard? <laughs> That's right. Gerald Briscoe, Sam Shepard, uh, Cole Pot. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, Jim okay, Lottis, a, Jim Lottis, I'll take that. <laughs> That's right. Gerald Gerald Briscoe, Stang, Stranger Lewis, Vulcan. There, there you go. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you so much, Steve. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys, and we will we'll be in touch here in in the. Uh, Monitor things as they go along, and you know what? I woke uh, John. John come up with this uh, because I'm just you know amazed that he was able to come up with it. But if he comes up with any more brainstorms like this, we we want to be able to reach out to you again to share to share the history. Anytime, glad to do it. Mm -hmm.